Hey guys, Toolman Tim here, coming back at you with another Ramblings from the Road. This is a special one. Well, there's going to be a few special ones. I'm putting a, a few episodes together for you uh, for when I am away. There'll be a couple of live ones. Don't exactly know when they'll come through, but they will. And I know how much you guys love these Ramblings from the Road. So let me put you in my mindset just a little bit today. I'm hopping. It's a good day, but I just got, so I don't know if you guys have seen this. Now, if you watched on the live stream, you would have seen the interview. Now, it may or may not have been in the podcast feed yet, but I just got off the phone, off the phone. What is this, 1984? I just got off StreamYard with John Bush. And if you guys want 60 minutes of get off your ass and get shit done in the nicest way possible, John is the dude to listen to. He's incredible. I reached out to him know, maybe a year or so ago to get him on the show. And I know he was busy and it never happened. His assistant reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, we'd love to be on your show. I was stoked because I've wanted the chance to pick John's brain for a long time. And we just got done with what I would call a masterclass on not giving up. John's an incredible dude. He has an inspirational story. So anyway, coming at you from that mindset. And this is crunch time. Seven days from today, I will be on the road heading to Tennessee to lay physical eyes on the land we bought, but more importantly, to meet up with a whole bunch of my fellow anarchists at Living Free in Tennessee Spring Workshop to present on murdering the poverty mindset, but most importantly, seeing our people. And I am excited. Becky's excited. I can't wait two weeks on the road with my best lady to have just a wonderful time. It's going to be great. Going to get to see Brian Alexovich and Corey as well. We're going to meet up with them. Oh, it, it's going to be good. Can't wait. Oh, and we're also going to take a tour of the Buffalo Trace Bourbon Distillery. So I'm quite excited about that. So where am I heading today? Well, like I said, as soon as I got done with John's interview, I hopped in the car and I am now heading, well, it'd be about a four hour round trip, I'm guessing, all together. I have to go an hour west of Provost to go do an occupancy check on a house that's probably empty for the bank again. You know, I do that quite often. So it's just a drive by, you put a note on the door, call us, whatever. So that, that's what I'm starting with today. So if it gets a little bit louder, guys, I'm on the highway now. I'll do my best to kill and filter out all this background noise the best I can. And then I need to go an hour north and pick up a dishwasher for the 12 unit. It's dead and there's nowhere, of course, in my town to get it. So like I said, this is the get shit done. I'm going to try to do three, maybe, ramblings from the road today if my voice decides it wants to, which it'll be fine. I always enjoy recording for you guys. Get those knocked out so that I have them in the queue for you. And with that, I was trying to... Now, last year when I went to Living Free in Tennessee, I put together, I believe, the, the little series. It was five or six episodes called Practical Preparedness. And the whole idea was getting prepped and getting prepared on basically a shoestring budget, you know, possum living, that sort of thing. But, but being prepared and the things you could do. And who would have known, but a year later, I got to do a presentation on that in my hometown. Anyway, so I thought, well, what kind of series can I put together for you guys? And you know, I've been working on that 12 Pillars of Preparedness series, which has been a lot of fun, but I'm not gonna dive into those because those are more in-depth, single, episode, single topic episodes. So I've been putting together this, what I call my rules to live by, or what maybe I would be better called, <laughs> my life goes better when I live them according to these rules. Let's put it that way, because by me saying rules, my rules I live by, that makes it sound like, holy shit, Tim, you always live by those rules. But no, I don't. What they are is things I've realized that if I do these, or if I recognize these things in my life, good things happen. So it's not a, you should do this. It's a, hopefully we can do these together because these are the things that I, um, I guess, have based my life around or have seen the patterns in my life and 
like I said, you recognize the patterns, you, you do something great. So I think I've got 32 of them at this point. This has been a list that I've been putting together for, I'll have to go back, but I'm guessing six or seven years. I mean, it's things I've been living by forever. Well, at least I think, or at least, you know, as I got old enough to become cognizant of them, started writing them down, started kind of, I don't know, parsing them out, you know, eliminating ones that were repetitive and then changing the wording a little bit so they're a little more digestible. So anyway, I'm going to try to knock out five per episode for you guys and we'll just have some fun having a conversation on the road. Only way it would be better is if you guys were here sitting with me so we could talk about this in person, but for now, it is what it is. So, with that, my rules to live by. Uh, my very first one is, how do you eat an elephant? And you might have heard me talk about this before, or how to eat an elephant. It reminds me, and I've told this story about the French guy who ate an airplane one piece at a time, and that's the same way. Now, of course, an elephant will uh, <laughs> go rotten before you could eat it, so you'd have to preserve it, but the, the idea is, how do you overcome something that seems absolutely insurmountable? I guess the, the easiest analogy to that would be in business, that if you told Becky and I that six years ago we would be making a lot of money, let's put it that way, in six years based on our entrepreneurial ventures, and you told us, look, there's the elephant, you got to eat that whole thing. We would have thrown our hands up in despair. We would have ran away and we would have just called it quits. But instead, being served one plate of elephant at a time or one plate of elephant a day makes life a whole hell of a lot easier when trying to manage those large, overwhelming problems. Another story I used to tell when my kids were little, we used to go to my uncle's hunting camp. I love that camp. It's just there's something special about it. We didn't get there as often as we wanted. It's about an hour's hike in the woods. And the kids would always be so excited. Oh, I can't wait. And they'd be running ahead and I'd be like, listen, pace yourself. You'll, you'll be tired. And 10, 15 minutes in, they'll be looking at me and, Dad, how do you do it? You don't just walk into this camp, but you carry everything in backpacks too. Because, of course, I'm carrying their backpacks because they don't want to carry them. Mackenzie's... Uh, Jiffy Pop popcorn because that's what he always loved to take in there and, and cook up on the barbecue on the uh, propane the propane stove or the wood stove. So anyway, I just said you know one foot in front of the other. In other words, you just look at the next thing you need to do, solve that, and then move on to the next thing. And it, it's that way in business. You can't if you look at these huge insurmountable problems, you'll never get them done. But if you just start moving, start getting your feet going and say, okay, what's the very next thing I can do to make this situation slightly better or slightly improve? And to be honest, that, that has been probably the number one mantra for mine and Becky's life over the years since, we, since whatever happened to shake us out of the poverty mindset. So what do you do? You just look at it, break it down into small bite-sized pieces, process the elephant, and then repeat daily until the elephant is gone. And that's like success. You know, talking to John Bush today, I, was, I, I thought about how success is exponential for the most part. And you just keep doing and doing and doing. And you see small gains and small gains. And then all of a sudden, all of those small gains, for whatever reason, just go whoom, straight to the moon. And it can take time. But when that happens, it's exciting. And that's from doing the small things every single day. Number two. How to fix a mess. You gotta, in order to fix a mess, you need to make a mess. And let me tell you where I first heard that saying. A good buddy of mine from years ago, Phil Robertson, he used to run a bike shop and then he retired from fixing bikes and he opened up a, it was called New to You Music and Books. And he sold sports cards and used cassettes, magazines, and all kinds of trinkets. He would have everything everywhere. And one day I went into the shop and it looked like somebody had gone by and shook the building and knocked all the books into neat piles on the floor, on the counter, everywhere. 
And I asked, I said, what the hell is going on? And of course, with his smart ass kind of, you know, mustachioed grin, he looks at me and he says, Tim, you got to make a mess to fix a mess. And that has always stuck with me. And I never realized because so often we try to fix problems or fix solutions with a Band-Aid. I'm working on the bathroom at the trailer rental that I think we just found out we now have rented. So I have about six weeks to get the renovations done. Now I could have went in there and I could have said, well, what is the bare minimum I can do to make this serviceable? But then I realized this thing is a mess. It's rotten, there's pipes leaking, things freeze, the water heater's in the way, the electrical's shitty, <laughs> the plug to the washing machine's broken, the light's hanging on the wall. I could attempt to repair all this, or I could tear the bastard out and start over. And of course, the laziness in, my, in me said, no, just fix it, Tim, just fix it. And so I would start tearing and tearing, and I realized by the time I got to the point where I need to tear everything, I need to make the biggest mess ever. Two entire, now I only have a short trailer, but it's a reasonable trailer. Two truck and trailer loads full of debris just from that bathroom. The only thing I saved was the toilet, and that's because I only installed it a year ago. But when it's done, we should no longer have any problems with pipes freezing. We should have no more saggy floors. We'll have no more spongy walls. We'll have a not so shady electrical hot water tank, all of the friggin above. How great is that? But that's the thing, when it comes to doing great things or putting things into order, sometimes you gotta tear the bastard down and start over. And that doesn't mean, here's the thing, it means tearing it down to the foundation. So whatever the business is you're building, whatever the content creation is that you're creating, You've already built the foundation, so you have, look at the foundation like it's everything in your brain. It's all the skills you've learned, it's all the experiences, it's all the mistakes you've made. That's the foundation everything's sitting on. And in order to build a better looking house, you're, you're probably not going to tear the foundation out, but you might tear the thing back to its studs, or hell, you might tear it right down to the foundation and put a new house on that old foundation. So what that means is sometimes, you might be married to an idea, or one of my favorite, Atlas Shrug, but it's always been done this way, so it should continue to be done this way. No, no, no. There are times when you need to change the way you're doing something. And guess what? Sometimes the rebuild doesn't always work. Sometimes you gotta rebuild again. But you gotta make a mess to fix a mess. And I guess you gotta take a step back to go forward. This is not gonna be all you know, it's not going to be full of cliches, but something I'm doing presently, my, my word of the year has been concentrate, and that was concentrate on the things that make me the most money. And guess what? The single thing that makes me the most money is my tool review videos. And so I am looking at the, the content, generators, backup power, DeWalt tools. Those are the three that have the most revenue per video and make the most revenue per video as well, if that makes sense. So there's a, depending on what advertisers pay for it, that's your revenue per thousand. So that's important. But what's also important is people are watching it. If you get that two combinations, you're gonna do well. So I'm looking at that. And one of the things that I've never really been happy with, even since I've redone them, has been my thumbnails. So guess what? This might sound simple or foolish, but small changes, tearing things down, most people won't even recognize my thumbnails when they come out now. But that's because those thumbnails are there to attract new eyeballs. The people who are already there are going to be watching them anyway. So there's that. But again, I had to tear it down and start over. Now, that didn't mean forgetting everything I ever knew about making thumbnails, but what it did mean was making new thumbnails. Now, I didn't switch to a new program to design them. I didn't uh, switch to a new platform to put my video content on. All I did was, hey, I'm going to use Canva, but I'm going to totally redo what it is. And that was my most recent, <laughs> you got to make a mess to fix a mess. And as we go along, you're going to think, huh, I have rules I live by. So what I'd like you to do, if you think of it, is share them with me, however you think you can. Telegram would be great, email, 
throw a letter in the damn mail if you want. I don't care, whatever it takes. But send them to me because I'd like to do a show based on the rules you guys live by as well. There's a ton of them out there. All right, so next, number three. Know how to do a little bit of everything. And maybe this is the, you know, modern renaissance man or the handyman in me. But my whole life I've always had this unthirstable, inthirstable, insatiable. Uh, ins let's try this again. Insatiable thirst for knowledge. I don't know, whatever. And that could be, and this, you guys can chuckle all you want, but I mean, one of my very first interests was wrestling in high school. Uh, like pro wrestling, WWE. Another one was this long ago canceled soap opera called One Life to Live. My mom used to watch it. I used to watch it with her. And I started a website on it. And mostly because I wanted to learn how to build a website. But like I said, there's one I've never shared before. But I was interested in it until I wasn't. And I was interested in wrestling until I wasn't. And that's kind of been the way I've lived my entire life has always learn a little bit about something because it can help you. You know, if you, if you know about troubleshooting, if you know how to fix a computer or you know how to take apart a water pump to rebuild it, or you see, oh, okay, this is a piston pump, that pulley, the bearings in the pulley or where the shaft goes through is stripped. Well, guess what? If I replace that or I replace the shaft, I put a new belt on, it's all good. You can take those same skills and turn that into fixing your car or your washing machine because the cool thing about knowing a little bit about everything is each time you learn a new skill you're a little bit faster at learning it because there's always something new that you can plug into use learn from based on the previous interest you had and then I just you know I keep building on that but you know, uh, good or bad, knowing a little bit about everything means you're going to be the guy that everybody comes to and it's like, hey, Tim, what do you, what do you think about this? Or where, where where do I start to fix this? You know, the, the yeah, I went in to get wings a year ago and one of my old customers said, Tim, oh, I got a lawnmower, gas lawnmower that isn't working. He said, do you know anything about mowers? Because he knows I know a little bit about a lot of things. And, Anyway, we talked for quite a while and I give him a few things he could try to troubleshoot and it's great. But knowing a little bit about a lot or a little bit about everything or anything, it's a great post-apocalyptic life skill too, I, I joke, but it makes you invaluable. It makes you a, a, a valuable piece of a local community. It makes you somebody that people want to trade with. It makes you someone they want to do business with. It makes you someone they want to associate with. So. You know, whatever it is, if that's a struggle area for you, it, it never hurts to learn a little more about a certain topic. But for me, that, yeah, that's another one. Just know a little bit about absolutely everything and your life will be better for it, for sure. Um, this is another one. Learn how to learn or always be learning. So always be learning kind of ties into the first one, into the last one I just did. But learning how to learn, you know, a lot of people say, Tim, you spend $40,000 roughly on university from 1999 to 2003 to go to school, to be a professor, uh, to be, yeah, to learn from your professors how to become a pastor or a youth pastor, something like that. You do nothing with it. How do you justify that waste of money, time, whatever? Well, for starters, I, I don't think it was a waste at all. But I've always, right from day one when I left, I said the biggest, and it, this for me was the investment. When I started um, in college, I kind of knew how to learn, but that was the one thing university really taught me was how to learn, how to digest topics, how to skim over things that weren't important, how to do research, how to formulate your thoughts in a cohesive manner how to teach things in a simplified manner to the point where I hope that's what I do in my generator videos now. Like today, there's a video coming out all about the, the Anchor 347 battery pack. That thing's a brick. But you know what I did at the end? I put in like a four minute segment on why battery packs aren't the milliamp hours they're listed for. 
and I do my damnedest to break that down into a digestible, easy to understand way. And for me, that benefit came from learning how to learn. And once I learned how to learn, then I'm able to teach. But there's so many skills on that. But it, you know, first it was, where do I put my attention? What subject do I need to learn about? Then how, how, how do you research? You know, I mean, AI's helped a lot with this now, but for years it was, okay, what questions do I put into Google to learn something? What audiobooks do I listen to to figure something out? And that's not something that a person's innately born with. Now, I know lots of people who never spent a day in college that know how to learn. But for me, that was the biggest benefit of spending that $40,000 over four years and not technically using it was I learned how to learn. So do whatever you need, do whatever you can to increase your ability to learn. That's all. Simple. Um, hopefully not overwhelming, but for me, that was beyond, you know, the few friendships I took out of there, beyond learning how to public speak, beyond the leadership skills I learned, beyond being able to say, oh my God, I have a four-year college degree, Bachelor of Arts in Comparative Religions, or whatever you want to call it. The thing that I took away from there was the ability to learn. So that was how to eat an elephant, one. You got to make a mess to fix a mess, two. Know how to do a little bit of everything, three. Know how to learn and always be learning, four. And number five, and I can tell you exactly where this philosophy developed, but it is almost all meetings can be replaced with a two-sided eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Now that doesn't mean that in-person meetups aren't important because hey, we're spending a bunch of money to go down to Tennessee to meet up with a bunch of our friends. And that's important. But what I'm talking about is the wasted bureaucratic meetings for the sake of a bureaucratic meeting. And where did this come from? I can tell you, I think I even remember the exact day I came up with it. But this was another thing in college. Once a month, we had a student assembly down in the chapel where all 300 students would sit and we would listen to one administrator after another drone on about this policy change or that policy change or how they were gonna move student parking from behind the cafeteria to wherever. And I asked them one time, I'm like, why do we waste our time going to these meetings? You could just put out a monthly student bulletin. And they said, well, because if we put out a sheet of paper, nobody would read it. And my smart ass was, well, when you make us sit down here for an hour and a half listening to you drone on, ain't nobody listens to you. So in other words, don't waste fucking time on something that's a waste of fucking time. And that's what it comes down to because have you guys ever been to a staff meeting where you're like, okay, we just want to get to the pizza and go the hell home. And they say, hey, do you have any questions? And Terry, the hearing impaired guy that worked in the shop out back at Home Hardware, would put his hand up and ask 17 asinine questions that were specifically tailored to him. The things that he could follow up with an administrator or a boss later on, but instead he needed to know. They're a waste of time, and that is the only resource that you can't recoup is time. So, man, think long and hard. Is a meeting important? Is a meeting necessary? Do you need to do it? Because a lot of times, again, it comes back to, well, we've always done it this way, so why don't we keep doing it? And for me, oh man, if I can get out of meeting in person, I will do it. We were buying some property from our lawyer and he's like, well, we need to meet in person. I'm like, no, no, we don't. You have an electronic signature, send it to us and we will sign it. You know, we had to meet once, but I didn't have to meet with him three times. And he's going to charge me the same whether I show up in person or not. But guess what? I don't care. That time's too valuable to us. And you know what? <laughs> if that time means sitting at home, watching a movie with Becky, or doing show prep, or renovating a rental, whatever it is, that's way more important to me than sitting down, having a meeting with someone when I can just look over some paper. But you also know, that meeting in person can be absolutely important. But the useless meetings, don't bother with them. So there, 
There's five of my rules to live by. Um, which ones do you agree with? Which ones do you disagree with? Hey, they're an opinion thing, so that's okay. I'm getting close to my first destination for today, a little town called Amisk. Um, it is, it's actually closer to 40 minutes from my hometown here. So it's a bit of a drive, but it's not too bad. Thanks for keeping me company while we took this drive. When I get back on the next episode, I will let you know whether the house was occupied or not, because I don't know. Sometimes they'll give me an idea and say, hey, somebody might be there, somebody might not be there. If they're not there, I just leave the note, snap some pictures of the house and report back to the property management. Hey, nobody's there. If there is somebody there, I take one or two discrete pictures to show either vehicles pulling in or pulling out of the driveway, a car parked in the yard, and I leave the note on the door. That's all I do. I have no interest in getting involved in any more of that, but this is just part of securing the bank properties and uh, the bank's property investment. So anyway, thanks for keeping me company, guys. I hope you're having a great day. It's six degrees Celsius. It's sunny. I'm driving in a t-shirt. I'm enjoying this weather. It's drying up really quick, but I sure as shit in seven days, we'll be way more happy heading south to the land of Waffle House and bourbon. So with that, guys, as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.